This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 5. End of Work. Magical Life. During the conflict triggered by the Law Travaillé, it seemed to be a question of government, of democracy, of Article 49.3 of the Constitution, of violence, migrants, terrorism, of whatever one prefers, but of work itself almost not at all. By comparison, in 1998, during the movement of the unemployed, it had paradoxically only been a question of that, of work, even if it came down to refusing it. Not so long ago, when one met someone, it was still natural to ask, so what do you do in life? And the answer came just as naturally. One still managed to say, what position one held in the general organization of production. That could even serve as a calling card. In the time since, the wage-earning society has imploded to such an extent that one avoids questions of this sort, which tend to make people uneasy. Everyone patches things together, gets by, branches off, takes a break, starts up again. Work has lost its luster and its centrality, not just socially, but existentially as well. From generation to generation, a larger and larger number of us are supernumerary, useless to the world. In any case, to the economic world. Seeing that for 60 years, there have been people like Norbert Wiener, who prophesy that automation and cybernization will produce unemployment compared to which the current difficulties of the economic crisis of the years 1930 to 1936 will look like child's play. It eventually had to come to pass. The latest word is that Amazon is planning to open in the United States 2,000 completely automated convenience stores with no cash registers, hence no cashiers, and under total monitoring with facial recognition of the customers and real-time analysis of their gestures. On entering, you make your smartphone beep at a terminal, and then you serve yourself. What you take is automatically debited from your premium account, thanks to an app, and what you put back on the shelf is recredited. It's called Amazon Go. In this shopping dystopia of the future, there is no more cash money. No more standing in line, no more theft, and almost no more employees. It's predicted that this new model, if implemented, will turn the whole business of distribution, the greatest provider of jobs in the U.S., upside down. Eventually, three-quarters of the jobs would disappear in the sector of convenience stores. More generally, if one limits oneself to the forecasts of the World Bank, By about 2030, under the pressure of innovation, 40% of the existing jobs in the wealthy countries will have vanished. We will never work was a piece of bravado by Rimbaud. It's about to become the lucid assessment of a whole generation of young people. From the extreme left to the extreme right, there's no lack of bullshitters who endlessly promise us a return to full employment. Those who would have us regret the golden age of the classic wage system, whether they are Marxists or liberals, are not adverse to lying about its origin. They claim that the wage system freed us from serfdom, from slavery, and from traditional structures. In sum, that it constituted a progress. Any somewhat serious historical study will show, on the contrary, that it came into being as an extension and intensification of prior servitude. The truth is that making a man into the possessor of his labor power and making him disposed to sell it, that is, bringing the figure of the worker into everyday life and customs, was something that required a considerable quantity of spoilations, expulsions, plunderings, and devastations, a great deal of terror, disciplinary measures, and deaths. One hasn't understood anything about the political character of the economy until they've seen what it hinges on as far as labor is concerned, 
is not so much producing commodities as it is producing workers, which is to say, a certain relationship with oneself, with the world, and with others. Waged labor was the form by which a certain order was maintained. The fundamental violence it contains, the violence that is obscured by the broken-down body of the assembly line worker, the miner killed in a methane explosion, or the burnout of employees under extreme managerial pressure, has to do with the meaning of life. By selling their time, by turning themselves into the subject of the thing they're employed to do, the wage worker places the meaning of their existence in the hands of those who care nothing about them, indeed, whose purpose is to ride roughshod over them. The wage system has enabled generations of men and women to live while evading the question of life's meaning, by making themselves useful, by making a career, by serving. The wage worker has always been free to postpone this question till later, till retirement, let's say, while leading an honorable social life. And since it is apparently too late to raise it once retired, all that's left to do is to wait patiently for death. We will thus have been able to spend an entire life without entering into existence. There is a good reason why Munch's painting, The Scream, portrays still today the true face of contemporary humanity. What this desperate individual on their jetty doesn't find is an answer to the question, how am I to live? For capital, the disintegration of wage-earning society is both an opportunity for reorganization and a political risk. The risk is that humans might devise an unforeseen use of their time and their life, that they might even take to heart the question of its meaning. Those in charge have even made sure, therefore, that we humans having the leisure are not at liberty to make use of it as we please. It's as if we needed to work more as consumers in proportion as we work less as producers. As if consumption no longer signified a satisfaction, but rather a social obligation. Moreover, the technological equipment of leisure increasingly resembles that of labor. While in our fooling around on the internet, all our clicks produce the data that the GAFA resell. Work is tricked out with all the enticements of gaming by introducing scores, levels, bonuses, and other infantilizing caveats. Instead of seeing the current security push and the orgy of surveillance as a response to September 11th attacks, it would not be unreasonable to see them as a response to the economically established fact that it was precisely in 2000 that technological innovation started to decrease the volumes of job offerings. It's now necessary to be able to monitor, en masse, all our activities, all our communications, all our gestures, to place cameras and sensors everywhere, because wage-earning discipline no longer suffices for controlling the population. It's only to a population totally under control that one can dream of offering universal basic income. But that's not the main thing. It's necessary, above all, to maintain the reign of the economy beyond the extinction of the wage system. This has to do with the fact that if there is less and less work, everything is all the more mediated by money, be it in very small amounts. Given the absence of work, the need to earn money in order to survive must be maintained. Even if a universal basic income is established one day, as so many liberal economists recommend, its amount would need to be large enough to keep a person from dying of hunger, but utterly insufficient to live on, even frugally. We are witnessing a change of regime within economy. The majestic figure of the worker is being succeeded by the puny figure of the needy opportunist, les crevards. Because if money and control are to infiltrate everywhere, it's necessary for money to be lacking everywhere. 
Henceforth, everything must be an occasion for generating a little money, a little value, for earning a little cash. The present technological offensive should also be understood as a way to occupy and valorize those who can no longer be exploited through waged labor. What is too quickly described as the uberization of the world unfolds in two different ways. Thus, on the one hand, you have Uber, Deliveroo, and the like, that unskilled job opportunity requiring only one's old machine as capital. Every driver is free to self-exploit as much as they like, knowing that they must roll around 50 hours a week to earn the equivalent of minimum wage. And then there are the Airbnb, blah blah car, dating sites, co-working, and even co-homing or co-storage, and all the applications that enable the sphere of valorization to be extended to infinity. What is involved with the collaborative economy, with its inexhaustible possibilities of valorization, is not just the mutation of life, it's a mutation of the possible, a mutation of the norm. Before Airbnb, an unoccupied room was a guest room, or a room available for a new use. Now it's a loss of income. Before blah blah car, a solo drive in one's car was an occasion to daydream, or to pick up a hitchhiker, or whatever. But now it's a missed chance to make a little money. And hence a scandal, economically speaking. What one gave to recycling, or to friends, one now sells on Le Bon Coin. It's expected that always, and from every point of view, one will be engaging in calculating. That fear of missing an opportunity will goad us forward in life. The important thing is not working for one euro an hour or making a few pennies by scanning contents for Amazon Mechanical Turk, but where this participation might lead someday. Henceforth, everything must enter into the sphere of profitability. Everything in life becomes valorizable, even its trash. And we ourselves are becoming needy opportunists, human trash, who exploit each other under the pretext of a sharing economy. If a growing share of the population is destined to be excluded from the wage system, this is not in order to allow it the leisure to go hunt Pokemons in the morning and to fish in the afternoon. The invention of new markets, where one didn't imagine them to be a year before, illustrates this fact that is so difficult to explain to a Marxist. Capitalism doesn't so much consist in selling what is produced as in rendering accountable what is not yet accountable, in assigning a measurable worth to what seemed to be absolutely unsusceptible to that the day before, in creating new markets. That is its oceanic reserve of accumulation. Capitalism is the universal expansion of measurement. In economics, the theory of the needy opportunist, le crevard, is called the theory of human capital, which is more presentable. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development defines it these days as the knowledge, skills, competencies, and attributes in individuals that facilitate the creation of personal, social, and economic well-being. Joseph Stieglitz, the leftist economist, estimates that human capital now represents between two-thirds and three-fourths of the total capital, which tends to confirm the correctness of Stalin's unironic title, Man, the Most Precious Capital. According to Locke, man has a property in his own person. This no-body has any right to but himself the labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Treatise of Civil Government. Which in his mind did not rule out either servitude or colonization. Marx made man the proprietor of his labor power, a rather mysterious metaphysical entity when you think about it. But in both cases, 
man was the owner of something that he could alienate while remaining intact. He was formally something other than what he sold. With the theory of human capital, man is less the possessor of an indefinite cluster of capitals, cultural, relational, professional, financial, symbolic, sexual, health, then he is himself that cluster. He is capital. He consistently arbitrates between increasing what he is as capital and the fact of selling it on some market or other. He is inseparably the producer, the product, and the seller of the product. Football players, actors, stars, and popular YouTubers are logically the heroes of an era of human capital, people whose value fully coincides with what they are. Microeconomics thus becomes the general science of behaviors, whether this is in commerce, at church, or in love. Everybody becomes an enterprise guided by a constant concern with self-valorization, by a vital imperative of self-promotion. In essence, man becomes the optimizing creature, the needy opportunist. The reign of the needy opportunist is an aspect of what the journal Invariance called in the 1960s the anthropomorphosis of capital. As capital realizes on the entire planet and in the whole life of every person the modes of total colonization of what exists that are designated by the terms real domination. The self as capital is the new form that value aims to assume after devalorization. Within each one of us, capital is summoning the life force to work. Cassenero, Apocalypse et Revolution. This is the machination by which capital appropriates all the human attributes and by which humans make themselves into the neutral support of capitalist valorization. Capital no longer just determines the forms of cities, the content of work and leisure, the imaginary of the crowds, the language of real life and that of intimacy, the ways of being in fashion, the needs and their satisfaction. It also produces its own people. It engenders its own optimizing humanity. Here, all the old chestnuts about value theory take their place in the wax museum. Consider the contemporary case of the dance floor at a nightclub. No one is there for the money but to have fun. No one was forced to go there in the way one goes back to work. There is no apparent exploitation, no visible circulation of money between future partners who are still moving and grooving together. And yet everything going on there has to do with the valuation, valorization, self-valorization, individual preference, strategies, ideal matching of a supply and a demand under constraint of optimization. In short, a neoclassical and human capital market, pure and simple. The logic of value now coincides with organized life. Economy as a relationship with the world has long surpassed economy as a sphere. The folly of evaluation obviously dominates every aspect of contemporary work, but it also rules as a mistress over everything that escapes that sphere. It determines even the solitary jogger's relationship with themselves. The jogger who, in order to improve their performances, needs to know them in detail. Measurement has become the obligatory mode of being of all that intends to exist socially. The social media outline very logically the future of total evaluation that we are promised. On this point, one can rely on the prophecies of Black Mirror as well as those of this analyst, who is enthusiastic about contemporary markets. Imagine that tomorrow, with every little word posted on the web, for no matter what online babble, exchange, meeting, transaction, share, or behavior, you will need to consider the impact this might have on your reputation. Consider next that your reputation will no longer be a kind of immaterial emanation, 
that certain people will be able to inquire about with your friends and professional partners. But an actual certificate of all-around ability established by complex algorithms based on the intersection of a thousand and one pieces of information about you on the web. Data which are themselves cross-referenced with the reputations of the persons you have rubbed shoulders with. Welcome to an eminent future where your reputation will be concretely recorded as a universal file accessible to all, a relational, professional, commercial door opener, capable of allowing or preventing an opportunity for car sharing on Mobizen or Deways, a romantic meeting on Metic or Attractive World, a sale on eBay or Amazon, and more. This time in the quite tangible world, a professional appointment, a real estate transaction, or a bank loan. Increasingly, our appearances on the web will constitute the foundation of our reputation. Furthermore, our social value will become a major indicator of our economic value. What is new in the current phase of capital is that it now has the technical means at its disposal for a generalized real-time evaluation of every aspect of beings. The passion for rating and cross-rating has escaped the classrooms, the stock market, the supervisor's files, and invaded every area of life. If one accepts the paradoxical notion of use value as designating the very body of the commodity, its natural properties, an assemblage of multiple characteristics, marks, the field of value has been refined to the point that it manages to achieve a tight fit with that famous use value, places the characteristics of being and things. It conforms to bodies so closely that it coincides with them like a second skin. This is what an economist sociologist, Lucien Carpic, calls the economy of singularities. The value of things tends not to be distinguishable from their concrete existence. A French Lebanese financer, Bernard Mourad, made this into a piece of fiction. Des actifs corporels, corporal assets. It may be useful to know that the author went from the Morgan Stanley Commercial Bank to the directorship of the Altice Media Group, Patrice Drahi's holding branch that controls Liberation, L'Express, and I-24 News in particular, before becoming Emmanuel Macron's special advisor during his campaign. In the novel, he imagines the entry of a person into the stock market, a banker, obviously, with his psychoanalytic and professional profile and biological checkup in support. This story of the insertion of a society come person into a market position in the context of a new individual economy was futuristic upon its publication in 2006. Currently, the employer federation, MEDEF, is proposing that a CIRET number a business identification number, be assigned to every French citizen at their birth. The value of beings becomes the set of their individual characteristics, their health, their humor, their beauty, their know-how, their relations, their social skills, their imagination, their creativity, and so on. That's the theory and the reality of human capital. The value field has incorporated so many dimensions that it has become a complex space. It's become the whole ensemble of the socially sayable, legible, and visible. The value that was social in a formal sense has become social in a real sense. As money lost its impersonal, anonymous, indifferent character to become traceable, localized, personalized, currency came alive as well. The modern world, wrote Pegai, is not prostitutional through lust. It's quite incapable of that. It is universally prostitutional because it is universally interchangeable. Something prostitutional enters in 
wherever our social value reigns, wherever a part of ourselves is exchanged for the least remuneration, be it financial, symbolic, political, affective, or sexual. Contemporary dating sites form a remarkable case of mutual and fun prostitution, but prostitution happens everywhere and all the time whenever people sell themselves. Who can say nowadays when all the reputational capital is so easily convertible into sexual surplus value that we are not in a phase in industrial production where producers are able to demand objects of sensation from consumers as a form of payment. These objects would be living beings, living currency, even if it existed in parallel with the market of inert currency, would be fully capable of being substituted for the role of the gold standard once it was implanted in habits and instituted in economic norms. Pierre Klosowski, Living Currency The giddiness associated with money derives from its nature as pure potential. Monetary accumulation is the postponement of any actual enjoyment, since money brings into equivalence as possibilities the whole array of things that can be bought with it. Every expenditure, every purchase, is first a forfeiture, relative to what money is capable of. Every specific enjoyment it allows one to acquire is first a negation of the set of other potential enjoyments it contains within it. In the epoch of human capital and living currency, every moment of life and every real relation are hollowed by a set of possible equivalents that gnaw at them. Being here involves the untenable renunciation of being everywhere else, where life is apparently more intense, as our smartphone has charged itself with informing us. Being with a particular person is an unbearable sacrifice of all the other persons with whom one could just as well be with. Every love is impaired in advance by all the other possible loves. Hence the impossibility of being there, the ineptitude for being with. Universal unhappiness, torture by possibilities, sickness unto death, despair, as Kierkegaard diagnosed it. Economy is not just a system we must exit if we are to cease being needy opportunists. It is what we must escape simply in order to live, in order to be present in the world. Each thing, each being, each place, is immeasurable inasmuch as it is there. One can measure a thing as much as one likes, from every angle and in all its dimensions. Its concrete existence is externally beyond all measure. Each being is irreducibly singular, if only from the fact of being here now. Ultimately, the real is incalculable, unmanageable. That is why it takes so many policing measures to preserve a semblance of order, uniformity, equivalence. The confusing reality of things is my everyday discovery. Each thing is what it is. It's hard to explain to anyone how much that pleases me and how sufficient that is for me. It's enough to exist to be complete. If I extend my arm, I reach exactly where my arm reaches, not even a centimeter farther. I touch there where I touch, not there where I think. I can only sit down where I am. And what is truly laughable is that we're always thinking of something else and roaming far from the body. Alberto Cairo. As its guiding principle, the economy makes us scurry about like rats, so that we're never there to uncover the secret of its usurpation, presence. To leave the economy is to bring out the plane of reality it covers over. Commodity exchange and all that it comprises in the way of harsh negotiation, mistrust, deceit, and wabu-wabu, as the Melanesians say, is not exclusively Western. In places where people know how to live, 
One only practices this type of relations with outsiders, people one is not connected with, who are distant enough so that a mix-up cannot develop into a general conflict. To pay, in Latin, comes from picare, to satisfy, to calm. For example, by distributing money to soldiers so that they can buy themselves some salt, thus a wage, one pays in order to have peace. The whole vocabulary of economy is basically a vocabulary of avoided war. There is a link, a continuity, between hostile relations and the provision of reciprocal prestations. Exchanges are peacefully resolved wars, and wars are the result of unsuccessful transactions. Levi Strauss Economy's defect is to reduce all possible relationships to hostile relationships, every distance to foreignness. What it covers over in this way is the entire gamut, all the gradation, all the heterogeneity among the different existing and imaginable relations. Depending on the degree of proximity between beings, there is a commonality of goods, a sharing of certain things, exchange with an adjusted reciprocity, mercantile exchange, or the total absence of exchange. And every form of life has its language and its notions for expressing this multiplicity of regimes. Making the bastards pay is good warfare. When you love, you don't count the cost. Where money talks, words are worth nothing. Where words matter, money's worth nothing. Thus, exiting the economy is being able to clearly distinguish between the possible divisions and, from where one is, to deploy a whole art of distances. It's to push hostile relations and the sphere of money, accounting, measurement as far away as possible. It's to banish to the margins of life that which is presently the norm, its core, its essential condition. There's a boatload of people nowadays who are trying to escape the rule of the economy. They're becoming bakers instead of consultants. They're going on unemployment as soon as they can. They're forming cooperatives, SCOPs, and SCICs. They're trying to work differently. But the economy is so well designed that it now has a whole sector, that of the social and solidarity economy, which runs on the energy of those escaping it. A sector that merits a special ministry and accounts for 10% of French GDP. All kinds of nets, discourses, and legal structures have been put in place to capture the escapees. They devote themselves in all sincerity to the thing they dream of doing, but their activity is socially recoded, and this coding ends up overshadowing everything they do. A few people take collective responsibility for the upkeep of their hamlet's water source, and one day they find that they're managing the commons. Not many sectors have developed such an obsessive love of bookkeeping out of a concern for justice, transparency, or exemplarity as that of the social and solidarity economy. Any small to medium business is a bookkeeping bordello by comparison. However, we do have more than 150 years of experience of cooperatives telling us that they have never constituted the slightest threat to capitalism. Those that survive end up sooner or later becoming businesses like the others. There is no other economy. There is just another relationship with the economy. A relationship of distance and hostility, to be exact. The mistake of the social and solidarity economy is to believe in the structures it adopts. It's to insist that what occurs inside it conforms to the statutes, to the official modes of operation. The only relationship one can have with the structures adopted is to use them as umbrellas for doing something altogether different than what the economy authorizes. So it is to be complicit in that use and distance. A commercial print shop tended by a friend will make its machines available on the weekends it is idle, 
and the paper will be paid for under the table so there's no record. A group of carpenter friends will use all the equipment they have access to in their company to build a cabin for the Zod. The restaurant whose name is known and respected throughout the city hosts after-hours discussions among comrades that mustn't be heard by the intelligence services. We must make use of economic structures only on the condition that we tear a hole in them. As an economic structure, no business has any meaning. It exists, and that is all, but it is nothing. Its meaning can only come to it from an element that is foreign to the economy. Generally, it's the task of communication to clothe the economic structure in the meaning it lacks. Moreover, the exemplary moral significance and reasons for being that the entities of the social and solidarity economies are so fond of giving themselves must be considered as a banal form of communication intended for internal consumption as much as it is directed towards the outside. This makes some of those entities into niches that allow themselves to practice oddly expensive pricing on the one hand, and on the other to be exploitative in a way that's all the more brazen because it's for a good cause. As for the structures with holes in it, it draws its meaning not from what it communicates, but from what it keeps secret. Its clandestine participation in a political scheme immeasurably larger than it, its use for ends that are economically neutral, not to say senseless, but politically judicious, and for means that as an economic structure it is designed to accumulate without end. Organizing in a revolutionary way via a whole resistance network of legal structures exchanging between themselves is possible, but risky. Among other things, this could furnish an ideal cover for international conspiratorial relations. There's always the threat, however, of falling back into the economic rut, of losing the thread of what we're doing, of no longer seeing the sense of the conspiracy. The fact remains that we must organize ourselves, organize on the basis of what we love to do, and provide ourselves the means to do it. The only gauge of the state of crisis of capital is the degree of organization of those aiming to destroy it. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.